record. So I am, um, I lost about 40, min 40 minutes of material and I'm frustrated, really frustrated. I get in these things where I can't, I can feel the energy. That is a constant. The energy is a constant. It is my archetype. It's not changing. It is the only constant. So I have this energy. And that's where all the nourishment comes from. That's where the grounding comes from. That's where all the resources are. And I don't know how to access it. I don't know how to consciously, on purpose, continuously tap into it. Because we're not networked into it. We exist separate from it. And that's the problem. So I need to connect with it. But in order to connect with it, I need connectors. In order to connect with it, I need connectors. That's what a molecule is for. This is this is going to be so much fun because I know jack and shit about science. So this is going to be like five-year-old math and five-year-old science trying to explain shit I know nothing about, but I can see it. So this is going to be really entertaining. Molecules are connectors. I believe this. I don't know it, but I believe it. <laughs> and... There are three connectors. In order to connect, you need a negative charge, you need a positive charge, and you need a neutron in the middle. And the neutron in the middle is what mixes them. It's what allows their compatibility. That is how they can be compatible for a prolonged period of time. So on their own, the positive and the negative charge are unstable. And when you have two partners, it's unstable. You need a connector. You need three, which is why most relationships implode after a time period is because there's no connector. But once you get the two or the three of you together, which is why polyamory people are solid on this, and I've seen this, then they can hook right up without a problem, supposedly, I'm guessing because I haven't actually done this yet, so this is an hypothesis, into the energy field. Now, you have to play with your partner. I believe sex is how you tap into the energy pool but it has to be with the right person. Otherwise, you're a misplaced molecule plugging in with somebody else and it doesn't make, it's not your molecule. Now my person is unavailable. We stopped playing a long time ago, at least a year ago. So there's no, there's no play. That's just it. Bottom line, there's no play between us. There's only work now. Now, that's my network. Ironically, I don't believe it's ironically. I think he is a clue to my problem. I believed, I have believed this for a long time. I believe my partner is a clue to my problem with you guys. Not with you in particular, but with the system, with all of this. I believe that what it is my partner and I are doing are the same thing that all of us are doing on a big stage. So if I can figure out his and my problem, then I can figure out our problem and I can connect us. So the biggest problem is trust. That's the first obstacle, which means I need to figure out what trust is. Trust. Uh, 
It's a consequence to an energy field. That's what it is. It's a consequence to an energy field. So you can be reliable. You can be solid. You can be stable. Reliable, solid, stable. You have to be understood. You have to be safe. You have to be logical. Safe. Safe and dependable. That's it. And you have to be known. You have to be identified. I have not told my partner who or what I am until yesterday. I might be part of it. I believe that with the right fix, it'll click and go back to the way it was. Not the way it was, but the way it needs to be. What if reading is receiving? What if listening is receiving? Then we would ask, what did you think? Otherwise you're guessing. You have to reflect. So I see this massive, I can feel this massive energy pool flowing with abundance. And I'm just like, how do you step into it? Let me put it to you this way. The vortex is a stream, one stream. It's going somewhere. That's why it's flowing. Where is it going? So people who manifest talk a lot about stepping into the vortex. And I'm going, I've been in a vortex, but there's a pool that it's going to. That's why it's flowing. It's a river and there's an ocean. I can see the ocean. I can feel it. I am metaphorically and literally right next to it. And I can't, I don't believe you can step into it alone. I believe you need people to do that with you. I believe when you step into the vortex stream, you can do that alone. But if you want to hook up to the big pool, you need your molecule to do that. You need your molecule. That is the purpose of the molecule. Now you have only a certain amount of time with your molecule before you need to hook up to that. And that's my problem is my molecule is broken at the moment. Now I know who they are. I've got three of them. Now I just got to bring them together and bring them together. And I don't know how, and he doesn't either. So it feels like we're molecules 
wanting to reach, wanting to be, but we don't know how. And we're running out of energy, just like we are running out of resources. So the logical solution is to create resources. You need to play in order to create resources. But he doesn't trust me because he's scared, because he doesn't know me, because he thinks I'm not dependable. Our mouths are the biggest problem that we have. so damn much I love him with all of my heart How do we get resources? And the universe tells me we play. Okay, so here's the myth, the lie that I keep having running around in my head, right? So I'm gonna show you their insanity. Time, money, resources. Secrets, no transparency, superiority, condescending, and I am going to call this entity Mitchell. Mitchell is the system, the government. He is a mindset. Mindset Mitchell. Now, in Mitchell's mindset, time. is bought and sold. Have you ever studied supply and demand? This is how it works. In supply and demand, if you have a rare commodity, it is highly valuable. And if you have a common commonality, commodity, it has a low value. This determines the price of the dollar. It depends on literally the scarcity or the abundance of resources. Now, Mitchell decided to make time your resource. Because he made time your resource, now we have a defined resource. But this resource has exactly 24 hours per day. Now, in addition, you have approximately 80 years of your life. Let's do this precisely. What is the current
life expectancy. 76 years. Okay, we're gonna leave it at 80 for a nice round number. Now we know that the first 20 years of those life is going to be spent toward education. So we can immediately cut that down to 60 years of your life going towards work. If you don't retire. Now, you now have 24 hours per day for 60 years. Of those 24 hours, we know you need to sleep. So we're going to take off eight of those hours and leave you with Sixteen, I believe, but let me confirm. Yeah, sixteen. Before you judge me that I can't do simple math in my head, there's a lot of fucking shit in my head. So, sixteen hours of workable hours a day. Now, a person has to commute, so let's subtract two hours of that. So, you are now looking at fourteen workable hours. 14 workable hours max. Let's assume one hour of that is eating. So now we're down to 13 hours. And let's assume that with all the bathroom breaks you take, we're going to cut one more hour off of that for the entire day for hygiene, showering, etc. So now we're down to 12 hours, 12 workable hours in a day. And that's being generous. I know there are people who work more than 12 hours a day. Now, you have your rarest commodity being broken down to an exact mathematical number of 12 working numbers a day for only 60 years. And this is the best part. Despite how rare of a commodity this is, we are now because it's highly limited, we're now going to charge you for it. How much do you think your time is worth? Now, mind you, this is assuming you do absolutely nothing else for the rest of your life. No play, no family, no breeding, no children. Just work. You know, as if you're a cog in a machine. So you're looking at 12 working hours for 60 years, if you don't retire. I would say that's a pretty highly limited resource, which means you should be charging top dollar for this thing because time is a really rare commodity. But Mitchell doesn't. In fact, the living wage is X. We're going to charge you less than that. So we're going to make sure you start off working less than the living wage. So let's say X is the living wage. We're going to charge you Y. We're going to pay you Y. So now the value of one of those working hours is Y. Well, I guess it would be X minus Y. Or Y minus X. Yeah, Y minus X. It would literally be less than the living wage. So now you are looking at, yeah, you are looking at selling your highest, most rarest resource, your time, for less than bottom dollar. That is the first insanity of Mitchell. We are going to call this the insanity because it's illogical. The next insanity is the resources. When you have a society and you have a system and you have people in that system, your existence solely exists on the nourishment and the thriving of those people. Now, we see this often. You have a family. You have a mother and children. There's rare resources. So the mother will deliberately starve herself to ensure that the children eat. 
then people come along and they say, you need to make sure you eat so that you can also take care of your children. But it doesn't matter. The children must eat first. Now let's assume for a minute, minute that I am Mitchell. Let's assume for a minute that instead of my eating these resources and instead of giving them to the children, instead I charge the children for those resources. Actually, I guess it would be the reverse. Let me think about this for a minute. Yeah, it would be. I got to think about this. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. So imagine the mother charging the children for their own food. Now, at this moment, you are imagining this model as I am the mother and those are the children. I'm not eating. The children are eating. And I'm going to charge them money to have access to that food. Now, we're going to shift this just a little bit. Mitchell is not me. Mitchell are the children. The one who's actually needing, needing Mitchell isn't me. It's Mitchell needs us. It's the exchange of need that we're going to focus right in on this. The exchange of who needs who. In the case of a mother-child, the children need the mother. The mother does not need the children because the mother has the authority. The mother has children, so she has taken on the responsibility of nourishment. Now, it's not a question. You give the children food. You make sure the children eat because I have an invested interest in those children. They are my future. I love them. I want them to flourish. I don't want them to know fear or hunger. So I will sacrifice and quietly deal with my hunger to make sure my children can eat because I don't want them to know fear. Very simple formula. I don't want them to know hunger. So between the two of us, my children or myself, I would rather I quietly handle hunger than put that on my children ever. The child needs the mother. Now you have Mitchell who comes along. And he has citizens. Who needs who? In the case of the citizens needing Mitchell, Mitchell should be nourishing the citizens. In the case of the citizens needing Mitchell, then yes, I can see definitely where they would require to purchase food because they need Mitchell. Money goes toward what you need, but it doesn't just go toward what you need. It goes toward who the authority says it should be. So let's say that there is a hat and the hat has an A on it for authority. And Mitchell is wearing the hat of authority and he is also saying, you need me. Now, that is lording, that is control, and that is power. If this were a mother-child relationship, that would be like me saying to my children, you need me. So you're going to have to pay money from now on if you want food because you need me.
or we don't need them. Why are we paying for food? If I were running things, if I had my own system, I would have me with my crown and I would have my hat of A and I would love my people like children. And I would not tell them that they need me. I would hope that they would become independent. You see, the issue is we have a codependent relationship with our government right now. That's the problem. We have a codependent relationship with our government. Fortunately, I know how to resolve codependency. So if I had a citizenship and a society and my own city, and I had citizens inside of that, I would take care of them. Not because I would want to use them, because I legitimately love them. I would want them to grow. I would want them to be independent. And I would want them to be able to go out and make their own citizens and their own cities on their own elsewhere. That's what I would really like to do. In order to do this, they have to be taught how to do it. So I would also include education to teach them how to become independent of me. That is what I really want. Now, in order to ensure, like children, their proper growth, I need to eliminate fear. I need to eliminate the question of, un of limited resources. And I would have to eliminate, actually, I would have to build on trust through transparency, hence the podcast, and I would have to lay out a plan for them to show them exactly how it would be done because fear of the unknown scares some people. So the plan would eliminate that obstacle. Now, in addition to that, I would make sure that they have food and home, shelter, clothes, basic essentials constantly taken care of for free because if they're focused on how am I going to eat? How am I going to live? They're not learning, which is why Mitchell decided to say, let's give kids free lunches. That is actually the logic behind that program because if kids are worrying about how they're going to eat, they're not learning. So they created the free lunch program, but then he turned right around and charged the citizens for food. Because Mitchell's goal is not to nourish us. It's not to take care of us. It's not to eliminate fear. It's to use us. Because there's a codependency happening between us and our government. I'm going to say again, I know how to resolve codependency. So Mitchell is a narcissist. Our government is a narcissist. And we are all a bunch of empaths. The third and the fourth perspectives, the foundationals, are the narcissist's apprentice. The fifth and the sixth, the sixth, the hippies, are the scapegoat. The conservative party. Conservative? No. The conservation party. The Green Party are the scapegoats. And everybody else is left over and ignored and shelved because they're not a problem yet. So this is the makeup, the mental makeup of our system at this moment. We've got a narcissistic, codependent Mitchell in charge who is literally using its citizens for its own ego, telling us, oh, you need me, you need me, which is exactly what the narcissist does. In the meantime, the empaths are going, oh, look at that. I'm needed. I'm needed. I'm needed. But when you go to the store and you try and buy food, you have to buy food. Now, once upon a time, before economy even existed, but they were still using economy because human existence existed. I mean, back before hunter-gatherer, early, early man, there was a sharing resource system. It's almost forgotten. The sharing resource system worked like this. You took 
everything you needed for you. And then the surplus was placed into a community you shared. You never were without. So you never needed abundance or excess. There was no money exchange. Money did not exist. Bookkeeping didn't even exist yet. Mathematics did not exist yet. This is very primitive man. Everything was shared. Now, in communism, you say, share everything first and you get one P, maybe once a day. Yeah. Communism says, share everything first, leave nothing for the self. That's not the same thing. This is the self produces resources. I will be going over how to do that later. And once the self produces resources, the self takes everything they need for themselves and their network. So your family, you and your children are cared for. Whatever is surplus gets shared into the pool. Now, there are times of struggle. There are times of difficulty, which is why sometimes surplus happens. Sometimes deficit happens. Sometimes you're going to see that flex. When that happens, you fall back on the stored shares. And the more people who contribute, stone soup. And this is literally going to be called the stone soup project, where resources are literally pooled. Now, resources can be knitting, food, gardening, farming, storytelling, story matters. It can be literally any kind of a passion you have where you put your, your joy into your resources. And whatever's left over gets shared. Now we need food and we need clothes and we need shelter, and we need joy. So that's it, food, clothes, shelter, and entertainment. We need to play, we need story. And yet, every one of these things cost money. They shouldn't. And we are all quite capable of producing these all on our own. We just forgot how. And in point of fact, quite a few people do these as hobbies. The question is, don't look at your job, look at your hobby. Let's pretend for just a minute that you live in my city and money doesn't exist. What would you do then? Take a look at your hobbies. If a job was not needed and you instead looked at your hobbies, what would you do? Do you work in textiles? Do you work in entertainment? Are you building? Are you sewing, knitting, making? Are you in the clothing industry or are you gardening? I'm in the food and the gardening. I'm in the gardening and the sewing clothing department and the story department. So I have three of these four resources. I love doing this. Oh my God. I love knitting. In fact, I knit stuff for homeless people. That's one of the things I do because I love knitting. I cannot, I have so much knitting shit all over the place and all of my loved ones have knitting. It's ridiculous. So that's what I do. If I had the space, I would definitely grow my own vegetables. So that's it. So three of the four resources. And when you break down resources to these four things, food, clothes, shelter, and joy, that puts you in only four of these. Everything else we have is literally an avoidant, from the shitty job we have, a distraction from the shitty job we have, a tool to help us get a less shitty job or the shitty job itself. Our entire ecosystem at this moment literally revolves around keeping the system, the shitty narcissistic codependent system alive. All of it. It isn't a system that runs for us because we don't need much. We need food, clothing, shelter, and joy. But the system needs a whole lot more because codependency and narcissists are high maintenance. We know this. Mitchell, the government, the system, the rat race, the patriarchy, call it whatever the fuck you want, is the highest neediest of them all. I'm going to point that out again. 
Mitchell is needy. Look at all the shit fucking Mitchell needs. He needs us. You know what we are? We are resources. That's what we are. We are disposable resources. That's what Mitchell has made us into. That's why we're so miserable. Because we have been turned into replaceable resources. In fact, they think so little of us that they are charging us bottom dollar for our highest commodity, our time. We are earning less than the living wage because we are nothing but resources to them, like slaves. And then the slave owner turns around and tells the citizens, you need us because without us, you would have no order. Want to bet? Woodstock, 1969. I'm going to tell you a story. During Woodstock, the officials were convinced there was going to be rioting. So they sent in a squad. The squad showed up. I can't remember the man's leading name who ran this, but we're going to call him Mitchell. So this guy shows up with a squad. They had all of the security in place. They were planning on a riot. Mind you, it's Woodstock. You know, drug, sex, rock, roll. We were all good. And rain. Lots of rain. And they were convinced there was going to be rioting and violence because there's no way the crowd could be this big without conflict. So the squad shows up. Now, there was a smaller group of people, a medical group. The medical group were there to feed the children for free. The farmer and all the neighbors, and I'm going to cry because this is fucking beautiful, realized that they had a lot of people. And all of these people were around 16 to 19 years old. They were children. So all of the neighbors of Woodstock got together and created a medical tent. They created a safe tent where the people could come if they had too much drugs and just rest and heal. No judgment, completely safe. And they also gave, gave them food. They fed the children. There were lines of children anywhere from 15 and up just eating. And they were just enjoying, loving, and celebrating music and peace. And there was a point when the squad came in and they were ready to go in with guns aggressively. And they basically were told to back the fuck off, that it wasn't a problem. And they couldn't believe it. They're like, no, no, you, you, you can't possibly have this many people without a problem. Back the fuck off. They're just here for the music. Leave them alone. It was this massive showdown at one point where the squad was going to go in and open fire and cause a riot on Woodstock because they were convinced that people could not live in peace without the government. And they did. Afterward, the squad backed off. They chilled. And then they were dumbfounded. It was actually one of the common reports is, I cannot believe so many people, so many children could come together in peace just for love, sex, and rock and roll. They were dumbfounded in humanity. Now, I listened to that story when I went to the Woodstock Museum and I watched the documentaries on it. And I walked away with a different perspective, as I do. I walked away and said, they don't believe in us. That's what this is about. Mitchell really has no faith in humanity. Mitchell doesn't believe in kindness. They don't believe in us. They don't believe in peace. I'm a psychologist. We call that projection. The reason why they don't believe it is because they wouldn't be like that. You see, when you have a foundational, somebody who's only accomplished the first four stages of ethics, barely, that person is going to project their own failings onto other people. It takes about the 10th perspective, the ninth perspective, before you start realizing when you're projecting. It's really hard to do at first. But once you realize when you're projecting, you can start reeling that in. That's, oh yeah, it's the eighth perspective because that's when boundaries happen. That's what it is because you get boundaries at, at level eight 
And then at ninth, you can start recognizing when you're projecting and when you're internalizing. So you really get good at it by the time you get to the eighth and the ninth. Now, foundationals project their insecurities. Everything the one through fourth perspective does is a reflection on what they think of themselves. So when they call you insane, it's because they are insane. When they call you crazy, it's because they think they are crazy. If they call you stupid, it's because they think they are stupid. And if they expect you to be violent, it's because they expect you to be violent. So we can safely assume that this government of ours has absolutely no faith in the human condition. So they think we need them. They really believe their own lies and bullshit. So they project their lack of faith and their insecurity into us, telling us that we need them to keep order for us. But they are highly illogical. They're not transparent. Watergate taught us that. Trump taught us that. There's just so many secrets. They are superior and they are condescending. You know, it's interesting because there are certain jobs that actually attract narcissists on a regular basis. <laughs> and one of the most highly sought at sought out job that a narcissist seeks is an attorney and politics. And the reason why is because both of those come with substantial power. Substantial power. Oh, narcissists love their power. Doctors see a good share of it because of the money, but that's where you get bad doctors with bad bedside manner, and a lot of narcissists can't handle the people part of it. Now, some still get through, which is why you see still a good portion of narcissists who are medical doctors, but really it's the attorneys and the politics. Oh my God, like moths to flame. That tells you something. That tells us that our entire government is literally made up of a bunch of narcissists. And they have the entire people in a codependent relationship, starting with money, manipulation, the communication system, making sure that we talk directly to them about their problems every time one of those consensus things comes into my house, I throw it in the garbage like, you want me to tell you more information about me? No, no, I know how narcissists work. It doesn't work that way for me. So what I propose, it's more of a nurturing role, very much a nurturing role, not a governing role. People don't need to be governed. Self-government is the goal. I don't want my people to need me. I want my people to want me. I want my people to choose. So free choice, and I do mean free choice, and that means zero consequence has to be the first law of my city zero consequence. You're not going to get choice if there are consequences. The second thing, no money. Because money is misunderstood. It's actually a gift exchange, a massive gift exchange. I would remove the problem with the resources being limited. Now I've done this before and I've had people argue with me about it. If you wanna participate, if you wanna step into the society, you have to contribute. Now I have had some people go, you can't make it, that's not right, that's not ethical. And here's the problem. 
when you feel you can't contribute, it's because you feel like you have nothing to give because you don't know what your resources are. And then there's debts, there's owed payments, there's bank accounts and tracking. But this is really interesting. See, the karma bank has a way of tracking itself. That's the way positive and negatives work. The karma bank is just the energy pool, literally, just the energy pool. And it's filled with a bunch of positives and negatives. And it keeps track for you on whether or not you have a negative or a positive. So you can go through a period of life of binging where you just take and take and take and take. And that's okay. And then you can go through a period of life where you give and give and give and give and give. And that's okay. And you can be the kind of person who gives a little, takes a little. Or you could give, give, give while you take, take, take at the same time. It's completely dependent upon how you want to do it. So that when you need to heal and when you are in a point where you need to put down everything and just say, I need to rest. Imagine being so free that you can just put down life and say, I'm going to just play and recharge and relax for a while because I need to heal. And let's call this your healing period where you're remembering and you're just going through your stages of life where you're just growing into the next perspective. Maybe you've been a foundational your whole life and you're coming into the cultivator stage. Maybe you've been a cultivator and you're sick of being a cultivator. It happens. We evolve. And our current system leaves absolutely no room or tolerance for evolution. Our current system leaves zero tolerance for our own personal evolution. We are oneists. We think in one dimension. So when we think evolution, we think that big science thing that happened to us a long time ago. Evolution is happening right now. Have, evolution means change, which is why when you get into manifestation, you see a lot of things about accept the change. What you're actually saying is accept evolution. But there's a lot of, well, there's Mitchell, who doesn't like change because change means they can't control, which is why the government is so anti-evolution, anti-change. But we're evolving. And what the pain most of us are experiencing is the government's resistance, our own resistance to the change that we are undergoing. It's not the change that hurts. It's the resistance that hurts. We're evolving. We are growing. It isn't a revolution. It's evolution. And I'm going to say that so many times. That's going to be like my motto. It isn't revolution. It's evolution. We are just changing. This is going to happen with or without me. I understand what's going on. And I have a plan to calm everybody down and to show you how it's going to go because I studied sociology and I'm a logician. And I studied human behavior and the human condition. So I know how we're going to behave. I know how this is going to fall. I know why this is happening. I know where it's been and where it's going, which means I can show you everything and literally take fear of the unknown out of the equation, which means we don't have to be afraid. Once we're not afraid, we can just trust the process and let it happen. But we need something to fall back on because the system is going to change also. Not fall apart, change. It's the resistance and the fear that cause war. I'm going to say it again. We have one planet right now, and we have 8 billion people, and the resources are low. What happens every time the resources get low? People fight. So what we are experiencing right now is just scarcity panic. I'm going to call it that because it's a thing. Scarcity panic is when the resources get threatened. And that is exactly what's happened. Somebody somewhere published, we now officially have 8 billion people on this planet and everyone freaked out. Everyone went, oh my God, we went from 7 billion to now 8 billion. <laughs> and then we saw an explosion of violence and war and panic. Just like we did in 2020 when everyone hoarded toilet paper. We saw what happens when you hoard during COVID. Let's not repeat that mistake. Instead, 
Take what you need and then share. Take what you need and then share. So, resources is going to be a big part of this. Understanding the gift exchange, understanding the bank account exchange, the karma bank, that's a huge part of this. Letting go of what we told, what we were told we need is going to be a big part of it. Trusting that we actually don't need the government. Trusting that we don't need their system. Trusting that we don't need money. If somebody gifts you, you know what I love about my life? I have so many stories in my head that I can give you an example of almost everything through story. There is a movie called The Mating Game. Watch it. Debbie Reynolds, The Mating Game. The story is about Tony Randall, who goes to Debbie Reynolds' farm, owned by her father, to do her ta their taxes for him. So he's going in with this Mitchell mindset, this societal mindset of, you have to pay your taxes. You haven't paid your taxes in 30 years. And he says, that's right, I haven't. So where do you get your income? I don't have an income. Well, where's your money come from? I haven't seen money in over 30 years. That's not possible. Yes, it is. And the movie progresses to explain how he did it. I think this is why I'm so optimistic is because I saw this movie and I know how it's done. This man has a resource called helping people and giving to people and supporting people. Those are his resources. So he helps somebody down the road. He gives somebody something excess, whether it be, oh, my pigs just had piglets here, have some piglets. Oh, you need some extra help? I have this. So he takes all of his physical possessions and he trades them for favors. He exchanges them for gifts. And it's literally an entire system that he lives off of for more than 30 years, just off of trade, favors, gifts, and helping people. He lives in abundance. He had over seven children and the children never needed anything. Everything was abundant. Poor Tony Randall was trying to do the taxes. So there was this one moment where he sat down and he goes, okay, so you did purchase this. Yes, someone gave me X amount of dollars. Okay, you took X amount of dollars and you did what with it? Well, I bought this. Okay, you bought this and then what did you do? Well, I traded it for this. Okay, so you bought X or you, you bought Y, you traded it for Z and then what did you do with it? Well, I fixed it up real nice. Okay, great. So now what did you do? Oh, I gave it to the church. <laughs> so the one bit... It was an organ. It was like somebody gave me money and then I went and got a wagon and then I traded the wagon for a horse and then I gave the horse to somebody who gave me an old organ. I fixed the organ up and I donated the organ to the church. So that's when Tony picked up a whiskey and just chugged it. He, he's like, what the? Watch the movie, The Mating Game. So it was extraordinary. And the thing is, this is how it used to be. Now, then I'm watching the show Outlander, and they're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing. They do this all the time. Scots do it. Oh, my God, Scots do it. The Irish do it. Lots of cultures do it. You know what culture doesn't do it? Americans. Americans don't do it. Americans are the only culture that doesn't do it. I walk into a house of any other culture, and if they offer you a drink, you say yes, and you take the drink because they don't understand gifting without receiving. They don't. So, yeah. I believe this is very true. I believe this is very possible. It used to be possible. It's possible all over the place. There's also a society that still exists today that runs completely without money, never has. There is one, it's, I cannot pronounce the name of this. I just read about it in uh, Time Magazine or somewhere like that. 
maybe it was the New York Times. It exists. It has always existed without money, completely and totally without money. It is a non-monetary economy. Time banks, community building, barter economics, moneyless interaction of individuals with a monetary economy. We can live without money. They have us thinking that we can't so they can control us. And, you know, I think that's pretty much it right there. I think that's the little lie they've told us little, right? That we need money to live. Well, no, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. What we need is a network. Oh, my God. I know narcissism. A narcissist targets the network. It breaks down the network. That's what communication is. It's a communication network. That's what I've been trying to do. I've been trying to build a network so I can function inside of my network without relying on the government or what they're telling me I need. But I am alone. I have been living alone without a network for a year, and I have still been able to pull it off. I'll be able to really pull it off once I bring in a network. And if I have a network, we need money because we don't have a network. If you have a network, you don't need money, but you need a network of people who think you don't need money. And I'm one. I'm a burner. I am a burner. <laughs> Holy fucking shit. There is a city in Nevada that exists every year for a week without any money. Burning Man, Black Rock City, Nevada. The entire thing exists without a single dime. They do it every year. And I'm looking at it going, why once a year? Why not keep that going? Why one week out of a year? Keep it going. What are you doing? So yeah, you don't need money. So let me show you how a narcissist works. Oh God, I love doing the narcissist talk. Okay, so you have a narcissist. The narcissist is here. The narcissist only feels safe when they feel in control, which means of all the mental disorders out there, hate those words, of all the behavioral uh, behavioral defenses, narcissism is the only one that actually requires a person. Everybody else requires isolation. So yeah, they require people. So if they don't have a person to control, then they won't feel safe. So if they're isolated, when a narcissist is totally isolated, they don't feel safe. They feel threatened. So what the narcissist will do is they will get people, they will build their own network, and then they will deliberately break up the communication of the network so that anyone within their network are not allowed to talk to each other. So you have a government or you have a narcissist. And the, government, the narcissist has two additional people. This is the narcissist's network. It is imperative that person A never talks to person B. This is called the triangulation system or the communication triangle that occurs in narcissism. You can Google this. It's all over the internet. This is basic psychology. So you have the narcissist who usually, well, who does have an apprentice. Apprentice is the person that basically idolizes the, the they can do no wrong. The narcissist can do no wrong. So the apprentice idolizes the narcissist they are the, okay, Draco Malfoy, great example. Draco Malfoy in this example is the narcissist. He's got two cronies. The first crony is the one who's most loyal to him, praises him the most, is most supportive, is most loving, thinks he's great. Now, the second narcissist in this circle, the second one, the second bully, is most likely the scapegoat. If anything goes wrong, it can't be the apprentice, and it certainly isn't the narcissist because the apprentice is in training. This is literally the psychology of perfection. This is how perfection is. I am the archetype. I have to be stable and perfect. My apprentice also must be perfect. Therefore, it must be the scapegoat's fault. If you have a mother or a father who is a narcissist and you have an older sibling, the older sibling is most likely the apprentice. The second child is almost always the scapegoat. If you have anybody else in their network, they are called the extras and they get shelved. They are supposed to be silent players. 
So a third child or a fourth child in a narcissist triangle will end up growing up never feeling satisfied. They will always feel invisible. They will always be starved. Now they've developed and they've grown with scarcity mindset. Meanwhile, you've got people like the, uh, the scapegoat who basically can figure everything out. The scapegoat is almost always the empath, almost always the black sheep, huh? almost always the middle child, almost always the one who can see the illogic because they're the ones who's always blamed for everything to the point where they finally say, I can't please you, so why bother? And they quit the system. So when the black sheep finally gets to the breaking point and they abandon the system, that's when they become the black sheep and the outcast. And now you've got the scapegoat who is now basically a nomad wandering around in the lack of network throughout all of life, never feeling like they belong. And the oldest is the apprentice. They assume the role of being just like mommy and daddy and they're identical. So the government pretty much is doing the same thing. You've got a network, you've got them at the top, the fourth perspective and the third perspective, the good, loyal Americans who say, let's make America great again, who are the Republicans and the Democrats, but mostly the Republicans. Those people are the apprentice and the hippie generation, the sixth perspective are the black sheep. They are what's wrong with the world today. The hippies, that is the problem. Everybody else is shelved and ignored. And that is their communication system. In order to take it down, because this is codependency, two things have to happen. The shift has to change in authority. And the second thing is boundaries have to take place. We have to set boundaries for the narcissist. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. So the authority is the first problem. It is when you realize that you are in charge because you self-govern. Now, cultivators, fifth perspectives are very good at this. Six perspectives are really good at this. This is where you get people who range from don't trust the government. They're right. Now, they might also be like third perspective or fourth perspective, and they are the people who are called conspiracy theorists. They are really hippies in disguise. They just haven't gone through the stages of growth yet, but they ethically agree with the hippies to an extent. They just got stunted in their evolution because we're not supposed to evolve. So they stayed at the third perspective. And then you have other people who very much are anti-government, who are all of the, the extreme, and they've just said, you know, I'm all done with this. Those are your Burning Man people. Those are the ones going, yeah, I don't need the government. The government can go do whatever it wants. And that's where I am. It's completely separate. It's not my problem because I'm not part of that. So I have my own thing. And this is where I noticed, oh, look at this. I have my own thing. And there's a lot of people out here and we're all unorganized. Well, let's get organized. So I'm going to call this Authenticity City. And it is my societal experiment where I am building an alternative. But I'm going to take everything I know about philosophy, psychology, and sociology, and I am going to put together what will actually make a society run properly. Now, I have been doing this since I was 12 years old, literally. I used to play a game called Let's Build Our Own Society. And I went into the what does it take to build a society? What are all the elements? What are all the rights, the wrongs? And what has our government done wrong and right along the way? So when you take a look at all of this and you bring it all into existence and you inspect it, it really comes down over and over again to the fact that a network equals resources. So you can either get your resources from the self, from the network, or from the system. Now, I am looking to offer you two alternatives. Instead of the system, based off of their monetary system and their slave system and their insane illogic, I'm going to offer you resources from the self and resources from the network. I'm going to need a bank, a resource bank. That's what I need now, a resource bank. That way we can manage the resources 
effectively. Okay. That's the next thing on my list is managing the resources. Oh, that's going to be so much fun. You know, that is something our society and the entire world lacks. No one is managing our resources. No one is managing our resources. It's kind of a whole hoarding it mentality with, wow, no one is managing our resources. I'm checking the logic. I don't think there's any one person in charge of any of this managing the resources. They're just there and we're kind of just taking them and we're taking them and we're taking them. And then we hoard them for ourselves and we might trickle a little bit back out. No one is managing the resources on this planet. Well, no wonder why everything's going to pot. There's no one overseeing the overall management of it. Now we have a perfect example of what happens when resources are hoarded just for the government, the people, oh my God, communism. And we have the other extreme happening with our government where no one's managing it at all. And that, yeah, we have a narcissist slave system. So your options are communism and narcissist slave system. No, no. Okay. All right. So those are not models we want to copy. Not at all. No, no, no. I just found this beautiful article on Wikipedia that actually talks about a non-monetary economy. So I'm going to research this, study it. And I'm already loving a lot of what I'm seeing, which comes down to time banks, community building, which is something I had in mind already, barter economics. Mm, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Moneyless interaction of individuals with the monetary economy. And then free contributions to the intellectual common good. Moneyless systems have a technology component, uh, having a technology component. Other moneyless systems, mutualisms, debts, labor vouchers, calculations in kind. See, it almost feels like we're nickeling and diming it to self. You know what it sounds like is, what if the person's not honest? It is as if a monetary system is built off of the idea that people lie. Now, I know why people lie. People lie because they don't feel safe. People lie because they feel afraid. People lie because there's scarcity. People lie because it's a defense mechanism. It is a defense mechanism. They lie because they don't feel safe. To say, oh, well, everyone lies. People can't be trusted. Lying does not mean a person can't be trusted. Lying means a person cannot be believed. Now, if you have your own perspective, why do you need to believe anybody? You know, I wrote my partner the other day and I told him, well, this is my perspective. I, I told him what I, in my perspective, am and what I do. And I simply said to him, well, there you are. I don't need you to believe me. I just need you to know. I don't need him to believe me. So if you don't need anyone to believe you, if you don't need to believe anyone, what's the problem with lying? Now, I know what the problem with lying is. There's like a whole nother thing there that's part of that. But once the person feels safe enough, lying goes away. Bottom line, once the person does feel safe enough, lying stops. Now, the reason why you shouldn't lie is it's internal damage to the self. Oh my God, does it? Because lying is illogical. And when you damage the logical construct inside of a person's mind, they go insane, which is why they're all insane. It's because they're lying, because they are damaging the logical construct inside of their minds. That's what lying does. And because everyone lies over and over again, because no one feels safe, they lie as a consequence. And now they have damaged the logical construct inside of their mind. So they're insane. So now you have someone named Mitchell running our government based off of a narcissist system telling us that we need money. No, we do not. We can get a different kind of system. We do not need money. Not at all. It happens all the time. There's lots of people who live without money. Just because you don't know how doesn't mean it's not possible. And I do believe I have finally figured out how. So resources, 
Self-love, identifying the self, that's the first ethic. Resources is the second ethic. And the third is learning what you can create with those three things. It is networking. The third ethic is networking. It's learning how to take your resources, combining it with other people's resources, learning how to trust people, learning how to build that network between people. I'm looking for my network. And if you feel you are part of it, take a look down below at my Linktree account, go through the directory. And if any of that vibrates with you, if any of it feels good, go ahead and follow the prompts. Thank you so much. And may the kindest of words always find you.